Yeah, so so uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about Fox Elator and, and exactly uh, yeah. where clinical assessment stands for it right now. Obviously, with it being FDA approved, we have some pivotal uh, findings and, and evidence for its benefit in sickle cell disease. Uh, before we get into deeper discussion, Dr. Jackman, can you give us a little bit of a primer of what I, I guess its clinical, most recent clinical outcomes have been? Sure. So it's actually interesting. So to me, it's a, it's a very exciting drug. Actually, it's a very exciting time in sickle cell disease because you know, I've been doing this almost 30 years. When I started doing this, we didn't really do anything for sickle cell disease other than treat problems after they happened and morbidity and mortality were quite high before, you know, with most people not surviving beyond the 20th birthday. And it's kind of gone to the other extreme now. So, you know, you know, we've had a couple major events over the last, you know, 10, 15 years with the use of hydroxyurea becoming somewhat standard, the potential for cure of bone marrow transplants, and then things kind of, and the use of transcranodopolis to, pre, to predict who would uh, be more at risk for stroke in the pediatric population. But, but now we, and then things kind of got stagnant in terms of new ideas, new, new things, and uh, we now have a couple new products on the market, you know, t- you know which is very exciting to us. I'm going to talk primarily about Voxelator. Voxelator is, you know, is a, works directly on the red cells in regards to oxygen of changing, increasing oxygen affinity. And to me, it's a very exciting product because as opposed to working kind of a roundabout mechanism, it really directly works on the red cells themselves. And I was very excited when this product got approved for my patients because, uh, you know, even prior, you know, to the clinical trial, to the pivotal trial being released, just following the drug when it used to be called GBT440, uh, you know, the the very objective data showing changes in uh, hemoglobin and bilirubin and sickle cells and other markers of hemolysis were very exciting to me. And then the, you know, we have had that pivotal publication in the England Journal uh last year and then the drug you know got approved and we've been prescribing it with a very uh been a very it's been, it's been a very interesting time and it's you know we it got approved i guess sort of you know early december around that time uh and we've been prescribing it since really since late december early january and uh, we're seeing some very good results could you talk a little bit more about the patient population that we're sure. seeing the most direct effect from? Sure. So right now, the drug is approved for ages 12 and above. So that's the, so that we're limited to that patient population to prescribe it to at this time off of any clinical trial or any other type of access. So the way I prescribe the drug is probably the best way to answer this question. And I kind of had a short list of patients that I was thinking about for this drug before it got, before the, knowing that the approval would be coming at some point. And so the ones that I've been, I concentrated on initially were the ones who had the lowest hemoglobins were the most hemolytic, meaning that they're breaking up the red cells faster. And uh, all sickle cell patients have kind of a combination of venal occlusion and hemolysis. And uh, what I have found that the majority of patients the biggest issue is venal occlusion, but a small percentage of patients, probably 10 to 20%, have primarily hemolysis. They're much more difficult to treat. They end up getting transfused periodically, somewhat routinely, uh, and they have very high bilirubins, very low, very low hemoglobins. So that was the first group I was I was treating. And then what we did is, as the patients you know were coming to clinic, anybody with a hemoglobin say less than 10, 10.5, we discussed it with. And then you know, the world kind of changed and things slowed down and now we're kind of building back up to speed again. But now we have uh, a number of patients who have been on a drug for two or three months. I think we've described it to about 40 patients so far, but we have, a, we have enough patients that have been on for two or three months to really see that difference. And we're seeing in the patients who had very low hemoglobins, very hemolytic to start, we're seeing significant rises in hemoglobin. We're seeing significant drops in bilirubin we're seeing them not needing transfusions anymore or to the same degree. And we're so we're seeing significant changes in use of healthcare as a result. 
uh, the patients whose hemoglobins were a bit higher, who were doing, you know, were not quite as overtly ill, but I worry about what's going on below the surface, so to speak. They're coming to clinic and they're like, uh, I had one kid come to clinic two weeks ago who was all excited, told me he just sent a picture to all his relatives in Nigeria because his eyes aren't yellow anymore. And, and we're seeing people excited about that. And we're seeing people coming in at least right before the whole world kind of fell apart with COVID. You know, we had a lot of patients come in and tell us, I can go to gym now. And uh, the, they're feeling different on it. You know, they're feeling energetic. They're feeling uh, better. And so the patients who were very, had very low hemoglobins, they've had the more dramatic responses uh, you know, when you look at the labs, when you look at them physically, uh, when you look at the use of healthcare uh, resources like transfusions, the patients who were kind of in the other category who had hemoglobins that were a bit on the highest side compared to the other, you know, compared to the very hemolytic group, they also have had tremendous responses, although it's not as overtly obvious until you start talking to them and see how you're feeling. So it's, uh, been, a, it's been a very exciting time.